What's up internet? My name is Kyle, back with another episode about cameras, tech, and all that good stuff. Today, we're gonna talk about astrophotography, the shutter speed, ISO, all of that good stuff, and it's gonna be a beginner's guide to shooting the stars. Okay, so like I said, I'm gonna try and keep this as a beginner's tutorial. I myself am somewhat of a beginner in astrophotography. I've only attempted it a couple of times, um, which I'll show you guys later. So I'm gonna go over what I have learned in research and doing it myself and pretty much telling you guys what I wish I knew when I've attempted it. So the first thing is you need a tripod. I've used a gorilla pod in the past. I've set it like very low on the ground, tilted it up towards the sky. You're gonna have the best experience possible with a tripod, something super stable, set it, forget it, don't touch it, it's not gonna move. It's gonna make the experience a lot better. You're not gonna be able to do astrophotography handheld. You're just not. Okay, and the second thing goes along with number one, having a tripod is using a remote shutter or a remote or trigger or a mobile app, some way to trigger the shutter of your camera without touching your camera or moving it. Now your first option is you can use a self timer so you can hit the shutter button which would move your camera a little bit but then when the shutter fires, you're not anywhere near your camera. You can use two seconds or 10 seconds, whatever you prefer. For a camera like the Sony a6000 which I'm filming on right now, or even the Canon M50, which I also own, which have mobile apps where you can shoot from the app. So you don't need to be near your camera, don't even need to touch it. You can connect to it and just start shooting. I've used this in the past. This is in my accessories video. I will link it down below as well. It's a very inexpensive IR remote. So it uses infrared to talk to your camera and then it you know, enables the shutter. Very handy, very cheap pretty cool. The basics of it is that you don't want to cause any motion blur or any kind of instability in your shot. So if you're using a remote or app or something like that, you're just going to get better results. Okay. So what kind of camera, what kind of lens, what kind of gear besides the tripod do you need for astrophotography? And really it's any camera. Now, obviously you're not going to get astrophotography pics with say maybe your iPhone, but if you have a DSLR or mirrorless camera, interchangeable lens camera probably with a kit lens, you should be able to capture some stars. For example, the Sony a6000 with the 16 to 50 kit lens, it can go down to f3.5. That is okay, it's not the best, but you should be able to capture stars with that. Or same thing, Canon M50, very similar. You should be able to capture stars with that kit lens as well. Now, if you want the cream of the crop, if you just wanna get your first camera and go right into astrophotography, the Sony a7S II, and hopefully in 2019, everybody's been waiting for it, the Sony a7S III, which is probably gonna blow away people with low light capabilities. But the A7S II or even the A7S have a crazy low light capability. You can basically see in the dark. So if you want the best astrophotography camera, that is a good place to start. Now, as far as lens, obviously you want a wider lens if you wanna capture more of the sky. Uh, you can certainly use like a 50 millimeter or 35 millimeter. But from a general consensus, people wanna capture more of the sky than what a 35 or 50 allows. But ideally people shoot with like a 24 mil or a 16 or a 12. Um, for the A6000 specifically, I've used the Sigma 16 millimeter in the past. You could also use Rokinon or Samyang lenses, which are manual, um, which have other benefits to them. I will put a bunch of A6000 lenses down in the description that are good for astrophotography. So two things that you wanna look for in lenses is do you want a really wide lens to capture more of the sky? And also you want a lens that allows a lot of light to come in. So 1.4, for example, with the Sigma would be perfectly great. Okay, so after the gear is pretty much the preparation of astrophotography. Now, this is a beginner video, so I'm just gonna throw out one website for you to look at, and that is lightpollution.info. You can see the darker spots, I believe, is higher on the graph, and then the more bright spots where you don't wanna be is on the bottom. So basically, it's avoid light pollution if you can. However, if you live in, like, say, a city or something like that, you could probably just go to the outside of the city 
and then you could capture some stars. But there are places like say Pine Creek, Pennsylvania, where I've been before, where you can see tons of stars with your naked eye. And that's the kind of conditions that you want for astrophotography. Okay, so now everybody wants to know, Kyle, what settings do I use when doing astrophotography? So this is the part that I didn't know about when I was out shooting the stars. I would always try and guess, guess things and just try different things. And that's definitely a part of the process. That's kind of what has led me to making this video is that I've learned it and now I wanna tell other people about it. So if you're confused or anything like that, that's okay. You're going to get through it, learn what works, learn what doesn't, and then progress. So the first thing that we've already touched on is aperture. So say your lens is a 1.4 Sigma, like the one that I use, I'm gonna shoot wide open at 1.4. That's gonna let the most light in possible. So if you have a kit lens, bump it all the way down to 3.5, and start there. Now the next is ISO and the typical rule of thumb with most photography situations is that you want to shoot with the lowest ISO possible to have the lowest amount of noise and it's pretty much the same here. The Sony a6000 for example because it's a crop sensor it has lesser abilities than a full frame you're probably going to float between 1600 ISO and 6400 ISO. This is gonna be one of those things where you're just gonna to have to test out depending on your light situation in the sky, where you are in the world and everything like that. Just know the more ISO you bump up, the more noise you're gonna introduce into your photo. Next is white balance, which you should be shooting raw, or at least I shouldn't say should, I would recommend that you shoot raw. It's gonna allow you to manipulate the photo way more dynamically afterwards after taking the photo if you do jpeg it's going to process the white balance and everything in the photo if you shoot your astrophotography photos raw you don't have to worry about a white balance setting you can always change that later since this is a beginner video i will do a very quick explanation of raw versus jpeg raw is like an unseasoned chicken nothing has happened to it yet and you get to cook it however you want a JPEG is Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's already seasoned, and then you can put extra sauce on it afterwards, but it's already pre-cooked. So part of the flavor is already in and there's nothing you can do about it. Hopefully that's a very simple explanation for you to understand, and no, KFC does not sponsor me. But if you want to, hit me up. Okay, so the next thing that a lot of people get hung up on is how do I focus in the dark and how do I get that infinite focus of the stars? Now this is where it gets a little tricky, especially for us mirrorless folk in say the Sony ecosystem, especially for the Sony a6000, don't have what's called distance markers on them. So for example, this is the kit lens. It is just a power zoom. And as you see around the focus ring, it doesn't have any distance markers. I will show you what that looks like. This is the Photasi manual lens that I've made a video about. And as you see here, it has distance markers that go all the way up to infinity at the end. So what a focus ring does with distance markers is it tells you where your focus is going to. So with this, it actually shows you the distance. And then once you go all the way here, you're focused at infinity or what the lens manufacturer would like to tell you is infinity. It's a general rule of thumb that lenses that have the infinity mark, it's not exactly infinity. You kind of have to play around a little bit before it. It's just not perfect on the lenses where the mark is. So what's helpful with lenses that have these distance markers on them is that you can turn it to infinity and then you already know you're very close to getting that focus down. However, like I said, for the Sony a6000 on the kit lens, or on a lot of their lenses, even the Sigma that I have, there are no lens markings. So there's a couple things that you can do to get focus to infinity correct. So on the Sony a6000, for example, when you use your focus ring, regardless if you have markers or not, you'll see, I think it's on the bottom left of the screen, it'll show you mountains and it'll show you infinity. Now, just like a manual lens or a lens with the markers, the distance markers, when you turn your lens all the way to infinity, it's not truly infinity. Now I'm gonna give credit where credit's due. I found another YouTube video where this guy tests with his Sony lenses 
where the actual infinity mark is. So what he has done is he goes all the way to infinity and then he goes back three quote unquote notches or you know three tick marks that you see when you're moving the bar. And he has found through testing that that is where the infinity focus is for a lot of Sony lenses. I haven't tried this myself, but his method seems tried and true. I will link that video down below so you can check that out. Another method that you can use is say you're already in the location in the daytime, or even if you're somewhere else, is using your autofocus to focus on something 100 feet or more away, so some trees or whatever object that's far away. Focus on that and then switch your lens to then manual focus or your camera back to manual focus and you're dialed in for focus to infinity. And then another way, which is the way that I've used in the past, is using focus peaking. So the A6000 and M50 both have this feature. What it's gonna do is when you're in manual focus with peaking on and usually set to the highest, when you're turning the manual focus ring, it's gonna show you a color of what is actually in focus. So even when you're in the pitch dark and you're pointing your camera up at the sky, it's going to show whatever color you have chosen on the stars. Now, when you get the little colored specks as bold as you possibly can, that is when they are the most in focus. So try the different methods, what works for you. I'm really eager to try what that other YouTuber has found out with going to infinity and then back three clicks, so to speak. Okay, so shutter speed. Now, um, when I was doing research into this and I was really trying to nail down what shutter speed should I use when I'm out there doing astrophotography, and it's really simple, but it's a math equation. I know people roll their eyes at that, but I promise I suck at math, but this is very easy. So the general rule of thumb um, through photographers is the 500 rule. Now, of course, there is a scientific reason why you should use the 500 rule, and that reason is... Hello, this is Ted Nanders with Newsy Truth Newserson Network, channel 87.5. And this just in from scientists all around the world, and fifth graders from uh, New Jersey have said that the Earth is in fact round, and it is spinning, and thus, scientific fact, the Earth is not flat, it is round. Ted Nanders, Truthy News, Truther Sin. Back to you, dumb Kyle. So anyway, the reason is yes, that the world is round and it's spinning unlike what some people think. And of course, that means that when your shutter is open for a certain period of time, the earth has then moved. And then when your shutter triggers off, then obviously you're in a different spot than you were a couple seconds ago. So the 500 rule, very simple, is 500 divided by the focal length of your lens. Now, it seems perfectly simple. However, this was based off of like a film camera, 35 millimeter. So if you have a camera like the A6000, which I use and most of you guys that watch this channel use, I think, and uh, the Canon M50, they are crop sensor lenses, so it's a little different. If you have a crop sensor lens camera like the Sony A6000, it is focal length, times 1.5 and then 500 divided by that number. So for instance, 16 millimeters, this Sigma 16 millimeter that I use for astrophotography times 1.5. So very easily you would do one six times 1.5 equals 24. So your equivalent full frame focal length is 24. So you do 500 divided by 24. So you do 500 divided by 24 equals about 20.83333 seconds. And then the other general rule of thumb is to just round that down to whatever shutter speed is closest that you have in your camera. So it'd be 20 seconds. Now, if you go over that, like 25 or 30 seconds, you're going to see the star start the trail and it's not gonna be super sharp. So if you only have one lens, you could do the math now remember that so when you're out there you're like oh I can do a maximum of 20 seconds or something like that and you'll be all set I wish I knew this a long time ago because in the photos I will show you guys I used 30 seconds it seemed the sharpest to me but I would have done better using 20 seconds and using the 500 rule 
Okay guys, so those are the general basics. You know, use a tripod, use a remote shutter or a self timer. White balance doesn't matter if you're shooting raw. Obviously, look for the best conditions. Try and be away from light pollution if possible. Try your best to focus to infinity using the different methods that I've highlighted. And then of course, use the 500 rule, do the math at home, know the number when you're out there and make it easier for yourself to get those really awesome photos. It's funny because in the moment I was super stoked on these photos, but now I, I feel like ashamed that I thought these were great, but I'm gonna show you guys anyway. I took this image in Pine Creek, Pennsylvania, which it's a pretty remote place in the middle of Pennsylvania. I wish I angled it higher, but then I was gonna cut out the cabin I didn't get the composition that I really wanted, but I got some of the night sky and I thought it was a cool image. Like I alluded to earlier, I shot this with the Sigma 1.4, but I shot it at 30 seconds. I feel like it could have been a lot better at 20 seconds. This next shot that I got is like, gonna haunt me forever. It's in Montana. It's in Emigrant, Montana, I believe, uh, where we were staying. Um, when we went to Yellowstone. I really, really wanted to get on the corner of the roof that you see in this photo, and I wanted to be sitting up there and I could like shine my phone flashlight, you know, like one of those pictures that you see everywhere. I thought it would have been amazing, but it was freezing for one, and number two, it was super wet. It was like two or three in the morning, and I was sliding down the roof, plus I felt like I was gonna wake up everybody in the cabin, and what if I fell off the roof? Then I almost dropped my phone off, but my girlfriend caught it off of the balcony. So yeah, she wasn't too pleased with me, but I got some cool shots, but I really wish that I had gotten up there. I should have figured it out, but I didn't. I will have to try and get that shot someday. So anyway, guys, that about wraps it up for astrophotography for beginners. Um, there is definitely so much more that I can learn about astrophotography. And this, if this is your first exposure to it, I highly, highly recommend you get out there during the night and try and capture some. I am wholeheartedly addicted to it. And I've only done it a couple times and I cannot wait to do it again. Okay, I'm going to stop rambling. Sorry for talking so much, but um, that's why you're here probably is to hear me talk, I guess. I don't know. I will see you guys in the next episode. Thanks for watching. Later.